Hello, this is Meathead. Hey, Meathead, how you doing? It's Rod from The Backstory, hosted by Lee Shranahan. Yeah, how you doing? I'm doing well. How about yourself? Well, I'm about five minutes away from going live on Facebook and YouTube. What's up? Oh, I caught you in a bad I caught you in a bad That's time. all right. What's up? I was trying to see if you might be free tomorrow to come on and uh, talk about what, we're, what we're, you're possibly making for the full. Uh, yeah, what time? Uh, give me one second. 4.30 to 5 Eastern work for you? That would be 3.30 my time. No. Yeah. Yeah, I can do that. Oh, perfect. Perfect. That's great. Uh, and um, I guess I'll, uh, I can email you uh, topics, right? Uh, yeah, I think, you know, 4th of July, uh, ribs is always a good topic. Uh, whatever you want. Um, okay. Send me the link. Give me an idea of how long we've got to talk and uh, what time we start so I can put it on my calendar and I won't blow it. Yeah, it'll be 30 minutes from 4.30 to 5. Oh, easy. And, um, Could you just send that to me in an email since I'm right now in the interface? I, you know, I'm, I'm getting ready to do a broadcast myself. Yeah, okay. No, I'll send you an email. Thank you. I'll Thank you. I look forward to seeing you guys. No, you too. Talk to you tomorrow. Bye. Okay, I think we are streaming to Twitter, YouTube, where's Facebook, and Facebook, and Twitch, all right, I think we are up and running. And uh, we're in business. We're still uh, seven minutes from going live. So I'm just getting tuned up here. Getting everything set up. Hey, Wind Drummond, you are first. Good morning. Good morning. Where are you? Where are you, Wynn? You're, uh, you're, you're, you, you think it's morning. It's, yeah, what time is it where I am? It's almost 7.30 p.m. where I am. Where the heck are you, Wynn? Wow, Brisbane. You guys like to barbecue, don't you? Welcome. Glad you made it. I'm going to come down there one day. I'm going to curse you with my presence. The Snowy Fox. Hello, Snowy Fox from Twitch. Okay, I think we are. We're, we're you know, about five and a half minutes from officially going live. But I like to log in a few minutes. Kevin. Kevin, I can't find me on YouTube? Really? Well, you're on Facebook. We uh, let me just check my dashboard here. It says we are on YouTube. Of course, this technology is way beyond my intelligence. It says I am streaming on YouTube. Um, let's see. Yeah, I'm. In fact, I just went over and checked, and I'm getting an echo of my voice. I think we are streaming on YouTube. Um, I think our YouTube address is um, youtube.com slash, maybe it's barbecue or amazing ribs. I forget. Hey, the Dog Fathers is here. He's on YouTube. What's the URL? Hey, Dog Father. Uh, uh, Kevin, who, who has, I don't think you've missed many of these, Kevin. Kevin says he's having trouble finding uh, on YouTube. But you're on Facebook, so what's it matter? Good evening, everybody. We're still about four and a half minutes away from officially launching. John Rogers, my friend, good to see you. 
John actually stopped by my house a few weeks ago with his amazing new pit. Very impressive. Um, okay, John Russ. Uh, well, what? I'll take this question, even though it's a little early. He wants to know how long before a cook can he rub down a brisket? He's hosting people uh, all weekend and would like to get as much prep work. You can, you can get the salt on long in advance. Uh, in fact, salt is slow to penetrate. So get the salt on now if you like. Um, it, it'll take time. Penetrate can't do any harm. Just keep it in the fridge. The rub uh, with the rest of the spices and herbs, if you're doing pepper or any kind of a rub, um, it, uh, it's not going to penetrate past the surface. So you can put that on too. You can rub it up, salt it down, do whatever you want, anytime, uh, well in advance, 24 hours. You can probably even start now. Not going to hurt a thing. Get a lot of the fat off of there, though, dude. Um, it's not going to penetrate through the fat. And when you slice it up, everybody's going to cut the fat off. And there goes your rub. The Snowy Fox YT says just won first place in a barbecue competition. Way to go, Snowy. Fantastic. Was this a sanctioned event from KCBS or just kind of like the, uh, the neighborhood event? Doesn't matter. Congratulations. Way to go. Let's see. Um, yeah, Dogfather is saying you can wrap it in plastic, which is a good idea. Um, it's not necessary, but it's a good idea. We've got Long Island, Maine, Pizza Man Pepperoni. When I was 10 years old, I spent the most idyllic summer of my life in Belfast. Uh, actually, on Bayside, um, a little town on the coast of Maine. My dad was a USDA blueberry inspector. And uh, we, uh, we lived on the coast of Maine for a summer, and I took sailing lessons in exchange for bussing tables in the cafeteria of the Maine Sailing School. I will never forget that summer. The best summer of my life. I love Maine. And I've actually gone back up there. I've taken Photoshop classes from John Paul Caponegro, who teaches and has a gallery up there. Um, I forget the name of the town. But what a brilliant artist, photographer, Photoshop genius he is. So Maine has got a tender spot in my heart. And after we left Maine, uh, Sirisak, we moved to Long Island. I see you're from Long Island. I lived in East Meadow. Dad had a butcher shop in it was Merrick Brands was the name can't remember the village. It was not East Meadow. It was just near East Meadow. He and Uncle Eddie had a butcher shop there. Richmond, Virginia. I've been there, too. Well, now there's some good food in the South and in Richmond, too. All right, we're 30 seconds away from the official. ha, <laughs> ha. Sirius Sox asking me, LeBron or Jordan? Dude, I'm in Chicago. What do you think? Uh, Jordan, no question about it. Okay. And we're getting uh, down to the last 10 seconds here. We'll get ready. I'll roll out the uh, intro audio video, and we'll get started. Huh? And uh, here we go. And now, at your service, here to help you cook and eat like royalty is the barbecue whisperer and hedonism evangelist from AmazingRibs.com, the planet's biggest and baddest barbecue and grilling website, Meathead. Before I find the crunch to let me live again, 
Right now the only thing that keeps me hanging on is a memory of smoking a stuff. Hey, um, welcome back. Uh, did, did that audio of my little theme song there come through? I had a little problem uh, tech. Uh, boy, I am not a tech whiz anymore. Um, let me know if you could hear um, that uh, lovely little theme song. Um, well, welcome back, everyone. And uh, the uh, last Thursday of the month, um, uh, we do this uh, every month. Um, always fun to talk with you guys. Um, I, if you've not been here before, the way things work is I usually start off with uh, a little bit of a monologue, uh, a topic that I think might interest you guys, that interests me, and then I, uh, uh, we launch into question and answer, whatever you have that you want me to talk about, and uh, we'll go a minimum of an hour, hour and a half, depends on how tired I get, getting old, and you know, this business is about getting up at three in the morning and trying to fall asleep again doesn't work all that well. And those of you who are getting up there in age know what I mean about getting up at three in the morning. So, um, Fourth of July is coming up. And for me, Thanksgiving means turkey. Fourth of July means ribs. And I mean, you know, you want to serve hot dogs, hamburgers, go right ahead. And in fact, we serve hot dogs and hamburgers along with the ribs because there's kids and there's others who want hot dogs and hamburgers. They're traditional. But for me, the star of the show is always ribs. And of course, that shouldn't surprise any of you since my website's amazingribs.com. You know, that's how it started. I don't know if you know the origin story, but the origin story of our website, amazingribs.com, is kind of interesting. I was the wine critic for the Washington Post and the Chicago Tribune uh, for many years. And uh, I, uh, I, I, you know, I was getting kind of worn out. And, you know, all the wine people say, oh, it's not snobby. It's wonderful and it's friendly. I got news for you. It's snobby. And I was getting tired. And I was drinking too much, too. And I just decided it was time. I had to hang it up. I sold the business. And I reinvented myself. Uh, I'd always loved barbecue and grill. And I was going to make a living as a web developer. Now we're going back to the year 2000, 2001. And web development was easy in those days. HTML was easy. And so I was going to build websites for small businesses. And, uh, uh, you know, since I could write and I can photograph and I had HTML skills, I thought, you know, I was a triple threat. And I started doing that. And I had some clients and it was moving along. But to demonstrate my skills as a web developer, I built this website called AmazingRibs.com with one recipe, my ribs recipe. It was a pretty good ribs recipe. And I was bragging on it one day, and my neighbor, who was a butcher, started thumping on his chest and bragging on his ribs. And the next thing you know, we had a throwdown. And it was him versus me, and my wife and his wife were the judges. And, of course... Uh, it, officially, it was a draw, but I kicked his butt. And I loved it. I had a lot of fun. And so it just started growing. Now, in those days, Yahoo was the number one search engine. Google was barely in sight. And Yahoo did their rankings with actual human beings. They went to the website, and they looked at it, and they decided where it ranked. And things also were listed alphabetically. So we named it Amazing Ribs because it starts with an A, like the Yellow Pages. Well, a lot's changed since then, and within five or seven years, the, uh, the website was uh, drawing a lot of traffic. There was no other really good barbecue website out there, and we were doing pulled pork and brisket and other things. We, I, I was doing it, and uh, it, it just kind of drew Google and Yahoo and Alta Vista and all the search engines. And the next thing I know, I said, well, you know, I'm not going to build websites anymore. I'm just going to barbecue. And it became a living. And the rest is history. Uh, uh, 2014, we launched our Pitmaster Club. 17,000 paying members with a 90% renewal rate. If you have not taken the free 30-day trial in the Pitmaster Club, 
Go to AmazingRibs.com. Take the 30-day free trial. We don't ask for your credit card or anything like that. It's a cool place. And uh, no race, religion, um, sex. Um, it's a civil environment. Um, everybody understands the rules. And they police each other. We police it. And you get out of line. We kick your ass out of there. And we've only kicked about 8 or 10 people out since 2014. So, cool place. Um, so, back to the subject of ribs. Um, just in case you're not up to speed on the varieties of ribs, let's talk about the different types. There's pretty much three or four different kinds of ribs. Let's We'll start with baby back ribs or back ribs. These are, now think of your body, okay? Your ribs, they're, they are in front here and they protect your vital organs. And there's a lot of connective tissue and fat in there and there's also meat in between the bones as you move further back those ribs connect to the backbone and when they get near the backbone there's more meat on them and they're kind of curved hockey stick shaped and um, those are baby back ribs and they come from the back by the backbone and they have meat on top of them as you move further down the side towards the belly the meat is not so much on top as it is in between the bones. And they're not as curved. They're more flat. And so spare ribs, which start at the end of the baby backs and wrap around the chest and include the tips, are less meaty, but they have more fat, more connective tissue, and can be richer and more juicy. And it's a matter of preference which you prefer. Now, if you cut the tips off, and you make them nice and square, actually rectangular, square them off. Those are called St. Louis cut. And that's the middle cut, the center cut. They come between the baby backs and the tips, which are right in front of the chest. And um, those are my favorite. Um, uh, they're, they're a nice blend of meat and fat and connective tissue. The problem here is, is that this is really tough meat. It works hard. It's hard working. There's a lot of connective tissue. And you just can't throw it on the grill and grill them up. When you do, you end up with really tough, chewy meat. And one of the things that you should know when you're learning how to grill and smoke is that your enemy is high temperature. Now, there's some exceptions, and we'll talk about that, particularly when it comes to steak. But the enemy is high temperature. The muscle fibers, when they're subjected to high heat, contract and squeeze out the juices. And so you end up with dry meat. So for ribs and other tough cuts, you absolutely must cook them low and slow. And that actually softens the connective tissues, turns them to gel, melts the fat, and makes them more tender. But a slab of ribs can take three to five hours to cook. You just can't throw them on a half hour before dinner like you might a steak. It takes time. So you need to plan in advance. And I like to cook at around 225. And not in direct heat. You do not want to be over flame or charcoal. You want to set up your grill in two zones. Or if you've got a smoker, you keep the meat away from direct infrared energy. No glowing coals underneath, no flame underneath. If you've got a grill, you divide it in half and you put all the left side or the right side, either one, turn the burners on there and turn the burners off on the other side. Or if it's charcoal, push all the charcoal to one side, nothing on the other, and the meat goes on the nothing side. It's like being on a sun, hot sunny day you go out in the sun, and the back of your neck gets hot. You burn. We all know that there's ultraviolet, and that's what gives you sunburn. But there's far more infrared. Infrared is heat energy. It's what you get from glowing coals, flame, and the sun, and that's what makes you hot. You step into the shade, and it's much cooler. If you divide the grill in half, hot side no hot. The no hot side 
is in the shade. And the meat cooks more slowly and more gently. And you're going to take those ribs all the way up to 190, 200. I like 203 degrees Fahrenheit. Well past well done. But you need to take it up there in order to soften those tough connective tissues. And that's why it takes three to five hours. But when you're done, you get meat that gently tugs off the bone. It doesn't fall off the bone. If it falls off the bone, if you go to a restaurant and the ribs fall off the bone, chances are they've steamed it or boiled it. And that's a good way to make really tender meat. But if you boil ribs, we like to say the terrorists have won. But if you boil ribs, you look at what's in the pot when you take the ribs out. The pot is brown. That's flavor that's come out of the meat you can't get back in. The best way to cook ribs is with warm air. Now, this is outdoors or indoors. You can do this indoors. You can do this in your oven. Turn your oven down to 225. It's, all, it's naturally indirect. You don't have direct flame underneath the meat. It's under a piece of metal. And just turn it down and let it take three to five hours. Bring it all the way up to 200 degrees, 203. And when you pick it up with a pair of tongs, it'll crack might even break and the meat will have the texture of a nice steak it won't be fall off the bone or mushy but it will have the texture of a nice steak that's the texture of properly cooked meat pretty straightforward and simple pretty easy concept the other things you want to know about cooking ribs is get some salt on it if you can several hours before you start cooking Salt, you may have heard me, if you've been here before, you heard me say this. Salt's the magic rock. One atom of sodium, one atom of chlorine, sodium chloride. They get wet, they get electrically charged, and they move deep into the center. And they denature the protein. They restructure the molecules, or the atom, uh, the protein. Uh, and um, they hold on, it helps hold on to moisture, and it amplifies flavor. All the other stuff in your rub, the sugar, the black pepper, the garlic, the onion, the paprika, the molecules are too large. They're not going to go very far beyond the surface, just into the cracks and crevices. So it doesn't matter when you put them on there, but you got to get the salt on in advance. And this is true of almost everything you're cooking. So almost everything you're cooking, salt's got to get on there in advance so it can do its magic. The rest of the seasonings can go on at any time right down to the last minute. And then the other truism, the other fact that you've got to get is always start on the indirect, the convection air in the shade, away from the heat, away from the flame, and gently cook them. And then finally, the last step is sauce. And if you do it right, if you've got a good rub, you may not need sauce. You may like it just with a good rub. Um, AmazingRibs.com has a very popular rub recipe that a lot of competition teams use. It's called Meathead's Magic Dust. Memphis Dust. Meathead's Memphis Dust. And uh, you can just take that recipe, and if you don't like one of the ingredients, leave it out. You can add ingredients, but it's a great jumping off place. And if you're too lazy to make it over my shoulder, you will see. We actually now have, and they're on Amazon. They're also on our website. I have three rubs, pork, red meat, and poultry. And they're really good. I'm pretty proud of them. So you can go with them. Um, the, uh, then, okay, near the end, when you're almost done, don't put the sauce on until the end. The sauce usually has sugar in it. And it can burn. And it can ruin your meat. So you wait until they're almost done, and then you put the sauce on. And don't go crazy. A thin layer of sauce is all. It's one instrument in the orchestra. You don't want it to overwhelm the rub. You don't want it to overwhelm the meat. You want all of them to play in harmony. And what I will often do is I'll do my ribs on the smoker, and we'll get some smoke in them. And then when it's time to sauce them, I'll put a thin layer of sauce on it, and I'll move it over to my gas grill, which I turn on hot. And I'll put that sauce facing the flame, and it starts to sizzle and bubble, and it caramelizes the sugars and gives it another layer of flavor. And I'm talking like four or five minutes, and you got to stand there 
lid up. You got to watch it, otherwise you'll burn it. And uh, that's how I do my ribs. Now, the other th rib that we haven't talked about, and this is the undersung but a lot of fun, are your beef ribs. And if you've never played with beef ribs, they are a treat. And they too, there's two cuts to deal with. There's the back ribs. So if you ever buy a prime rib, like for Christmas, the ribs that are attached are curved. They're just like baby back ribs. And I cut them off. For my prime rib, I want a tube of meat so that it cooks evenly all around and I get a nice crust all around. I'll take those bones off and I'll put them in the freezer and I'll come back a week or two later and I'll cook that slab of beef ribs, back ribs. And boy, they are good. It's a whole different flavor. Um, and you treat them with salt and pepper. You don't need any sugar on your rub. And they are just awesome. Now, if you move further down the side, on pork we call them spare ribs or St. Louis cut. But down the side, further down the side, you can get a really thick piece of rib meat. And um, uh, those babies are awesome. And we, we often call them dinosaur ribs because they can be like six to eight inches long and two inches thick. And they take a long time to cook, eight, ten hours sometimes. Um, but those are just fantastic. And you'll see them in restaurants in Texas. And more and more we're seeing them around the country. So if you haven't played with beef ribs, go to AmazingRibs.com and look up beef ribs and see the different cuts and the different options. Okay. Well, that's my little monologue for the night. Um, let's scroll up here and see what questions you have. And if you've got questions, hit me, baby. Kevin, I hope you finally got hooked up on uh, YouTube if that's what you wanted. Okay, I'm working my way down the list. I've got this cool program called Ecamm Live. And I can see whether you're on Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, all of them. Barbecue Mike. Dan Mancuso. Good to see you back, Dan. Dan's here almost every month. So is Kevin. Are you from Portland? I love Portland. Several years ago, my wife and I flew up to Portland on a weekend vacation. And there was a street fair right in front of the art museum, which was a great art museum. And the street fair was cool. And we just ate wonderfully. And of course, fresh salmon. We had a dish, which I've replicated on our website. It was just a slab of salmon filet that he had cooked on a flat top. And then he put it on top of an icy cold sa salad. Hot juicy salmon on a cold salad. Boy, that's good. Sersalsack. You know, I'm going to blow your name all night long. I'm so sorry. I'm going to call you Mr. Scootin. Um, he said I taught him how to cook chicken. Thank you. Uh-huh. Kevin said he had a, a famous chef argue about beer can chicken. Oh, I'll do the touch base on that one. Everybody loves beer can chicken. And the reason you love beer can chicken is because it's roast chicken. And everybody loves roast chicken. But the beer can has nothing to do with it. The beer has nothing to do with it. It's a myth. There's, it's not hot enough to evaporate the beer. And the beer can't go through the metal sides of the can into the chicken. And even if it could, the chicken is fully saturated with water. There's no room for any more moisture in there. You just, it, all it does is hold the chicken vertical, which is, and it makes it look cool. So the beer can, it's, it's a myth. And if you don't believe me, I have written extensively on this including tests we have done with thermometers and um, scales. We actually discovered that often the can comes out weighing more than going in. 
And that's because the juices from the chicken get into the can. And they lay on top of the beer. Which would prevent it from evaporating even if it got hot enough to evaporate. And there's no way it gets hot enough because the chicken is coming out of the fridge at 38 degrees. It's a chicken koozie. It wraps around the beer and keeps it cold, just like a beer can koozie. And if the chicken is done properly, it's done at 160 to 170. Boiling water, and that's what beer is, is water, is 212. It doesn't get anywhere near boiling or steaming. Ah, Steve Ackerman says, Sangiovese and brisket, a match made in heaven. I'll buy that. It's a great variety. It's not all that well known in this country. It's, it's the great variety that is the um, backbone of Chianti in Italy. And yeah, they, they, they really do work together nicely. Yeah, Kevin is pointing out sous vide works really well on these tough connective tissues. Mr. Scooten is calling me the food science guy. You know, it's interesting, but I'm not alone. You know, the art world, for example, I did my master's in art. The art world has all these movements. You got the impressionists, the modernists, the fauvists. Well, in the culinary world, the movement du jour, I call them the geeks or the, 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 um, um, uh, techies or whatever. Uh, but there's a whole bunch of us out there. I mean, we all know Alton Brown and Christopher Kimball at Milk Street. And uh, that we're all interested in the food science. And in the barbecue world, I'm kind of the one who talked the most about it because I started hanging out with scientists. I married a scientist. Um, and, and so, you know, we, we got deep into the science. But culinary science is an important part of culinary art. And in fact, that's a theme in my new book. I'm working on a new book. I have a contract from HarperCollins, and the book will be done next March, and then it'll come out a year later. So it won't be out till March 24. But I'm working hard on it. It's pretty good. And it's, it's called The Meathead Method, Culinary science meets culinary art. And uh, I'm having fun with it. Um, Jason Pettis is asking if we've tested um, MSG. Does it penetrate like salt? Um, it, it does. Um, not quite as well, but it does penetrate. Um, uh, Lewis Park says he loves the rubs. Uh, curious about the choice to add smoke flavor to the rubs rather than just get it from the smoker yourself. Well, we, 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 we've been giving away really good rub recipes for free. And we, I was at this, I, was, I went down to Old World Spices in Kansas City. And they're one of these great, huge spice makers. And I went down there because I wanted to learn more about the way spices work and the solubility of spices and whether they dissolve best in oil or water or alcohol or do some dissolve better in oil and less in water and vice versa and so on. And there's a guy named Jerry who's the head of their lab down there and I wanted to meet Jerry and learn from him about spices. And while I was there, the marketing director came up to me and she says to me, why don't you make rubs for the market? And I said, because I'm no point in me competing with Sweet Baby Ray, uh, rubs and sauces with Sweet Baby Ray, and every barbecue joint in America. I mean, and she says, don't you know your brand is better known than any of them? Oh, my goodness, I said. Well, we hooked up with them. It took us a year, but we came out with three rubs and a sauce, and they had to be different from what's on the website. But the recipes that are on the website, I worked so hard at them I just kept going back to them, and I didn't want to duplicate them in the bottle. 
So we start we started fiddling with them, and we found some new ingredients that we thought would really work well in them. Um, we took some things out, we added some things, so they're different than the recipe on the website. And one of the things we did was we added smoke flavored ingredients to them, and that's because a lot of people are stuck in condos and apartments and high rises and dormitories. And they really can't use a smoker. So if you've got a little bit of smoke in the rubs and sauce, you can get a little closer to that. So that's why, Lewis, we added uh, smoke flavored ingredients. Hey, dog face pony soldier from the pit. We have one of our pit master club members here. Good to see you, pal. How do I store the ribs in the freezer? Um, this is interesting. Plastic wrap is not airtight. You can wrap it in um, uh, that um, uh, saran wrap and stuff, and it still breathes. Air gets in. Um, so the, the first step is usually you wrap it in plastic wrap, and then you wrap it in foil. Um, and usually that's enough. The key is, is oxygen is the enemy. Oxygen causes fat to change its chemistry, and it, it's called rancidity. It goes rancid. And pork fat goes rancid faster than beef fat. So you really want to wrap it tight, and I, I, I just, you know, the, the, the best way to freeze things is as fast as humanly possible. If you freeze it slowly, it forms large ice crystals. And those large ice crystals poke holes in the muscle fibers. And then when you thaw it, a lot of liquid seeps out. So the best freezing circumstances are these blast freezers, which are really cold. And when they use those, you get tiny little uh, ice crystals. And this is really important for fish. Um, I subscribe to a service called Sitka Salmon Shares. Um, it's a seafood monthly subscription. I get a, I get a box of fish from, sa from Alaska every month, and they do it right. Then they blast freeze it, and when I take it out of those plastic bags, it's just as good as fresh. And the same thing goes for other meats, too, if you can fast freeze it. Well, most of us don't have blast freezers. So what you do is, if you can, is you wrap it up and you set it on a wire rack so that the air can circulate all around it. Once it's frozen, you can take the rack out. You can just bury it at the bottom. But you want to freeze it as quickly as possible. And so if you just take it and wrap it and throw it in the freezer, it's laying on top of already frozen stuff, and it's not going to freeze as quickly. So if you can, put it on a rack where air can circulate, get it frozen, and then you can take it off the rack. Nathan Tracy, how does sous vide compare to oven or grill? You know, that's a great question, and I've done a lot of sous vide. In fact, I wrote a book, which you can buy on Amazon for $3.99, called Sous Vide Q. And it's about how to combine sous vide with the grill and the smoker. And it's only $3.99. In fact, if you join our Pitmaster Club, you get it for free. Um, we have six ebooks called Deep Dive Guides, and all six are available free to members of our Pitmaster Club. Um, and this sous vide Q book talks about just that. Sous vide is a technique, and I'm just going to touch on it because I know that there's a few folks out there <clears throat> who are still not familiar with the system. But, you know, when you're Cooking on a, on a grill or a smoker. Let's say you're, you're, you're smoking a slab of ribs at 225. Um, but you're going to take them off at 200, 203. Well, you've got the meat is gradually warming, 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 warming until it can't go any higher. And the, the key is, whether it's a steak or chicken or ribs, you want to get it out at the ideal temperature. A steak, 130 to 135 chicken 160 to 170, ribs 200 or so. So you got to get it out. And you're, you're, it's like trying to jump on a moving train. You know, you want the train to stop. Then you can get on it. Well, sous vide is this technique where you put meat into a Ziploc bag or a, just a vacuum bag and you suck the air out. And it's easy to do. And 
uh, you put it into a, a bucket of water or a pot, and you put in a heating element, and they sell them. They're about 100, 200 bucks, and you, they're digital, and you set the temperature. So let's say you're going to do a steak, and 130, 135, medium rare, perfect temperature. So you set the temperature for the water to 130. Well, the steak will go up to 130, and it can't go to 131. can't go to 140. It can't go beyond that. The water temperature is the regulator, and you can hold it there for hours. And it's a very fine way to nail the temperature and not overcook, but it also is a very tender, uh, a gentle cooking method. And the food comes out very tender and juicy. The problem is, is it's cooked in a plastic bag in a bucket of water. And when it comes out, it is gray and ugly. And it, basically, the only flavor you have is the meat. You can put herbs and spices and oil in the bag. They just don't do much good. You can smoke it before you put it in the bag. It doesn't do much good. When it comes out of the bag, then you need to season it. Then you need to grill it or smoke it or sear it and put flavor on it. Well, if you do, it's pretty darn good. But if you, and I've done this, I've done um, a ribeye steak sous vide and a ribeye steak reverse sear. And side by side, the sous vide steak is more tender and slightly more juicy. But the reverse sear steak is much more flavorful. That warm air cooking technique, plus the smoke and the flame, is much better tasting. But there's real good reasons to do sous vide. In fact, I'm working on my new book today. And today, I was working on a recipe for cannabis butter. <laughs> yeah. How to make a compound butter with cannabis. And sous vide is a really good way to do it. So sous vide has some really great technique advantages. Um, and uh, th there'll be a lot of that in my new book. But <clears throat> if you really want to learn, just go to... Um, Amazon and look for, um, uh, it's um, called Sous Vide Q by Meathead, and it's $3.99. It's an ebook, um, and it's just chock full of information on sous vide, combining it with the grill, and the strengths and weaknesses and the tricks and trade. Some good uses for, ah, Sky Joe, some good uses for leftover pickle juice from a jar of pickles. Well, you're setting me up, and I bet you're, you have a sense for what I'm going to say. Um, this is, pickle juice is a great brining solution. First of all, it's full of salt. It's a brine. And it's got usually vinegar and acid. So, I mean, if you want to do uh, marinate some chicken, and I, who doesn't love fried chicken? Everybody who loves fried chicken. I'm here to tell you, and I've written about this on AmazingRibs.com, so... Go go go! read there. The best way to fry chicken is in a Dutch oven on a gas grill. You do fried chicken in a frying pan on your stove, and when you're done, your stove is covered with grease, the smoke alarm has gone off, the house smells like oil, the food tastes great. Take it outside. It's not dangerous. First of all, in a Dutch oven, it's not going to splash over. And God forbid it, you do knock it over, and it, the worst that's going to happen is going to set you're going to set your gas grill on fire. But you're not going to knock over a Dutch oven. Indoors, if you're fr deep frying, you knock it over, you're going to burn your house down. Uh, get a Dutch oven, set up your gas grill in two zones, and put the flame right under the Dutch oven, an inch or two of oil in the bottom, Marinate your chicken and your pickle juice. Then roll it around in flour. That's all you need. If you want to do breadcrumbs or do a double dip into eggs and all that, you can do all that. But really, all you need to do is just marinate it for a few hours or overnight in pickle juice. Or just any old brine. Doesn't have to be, um, uh, uh, you know, a, a dairy product or anything like that. Roll it around in some flour 
and 375 is your temperature for the oil and you can measure that with your thermopan or your oil and when it's done when it's beautiful and golden you can take it out and you can tamp the meat and if the meat is still not quite done in the center which is often the case the crust is perfect it's golden but it's not quite safe in the center you take it out and you put it on the grill right next to the um, Dutch oven. And you put your next batch of food in the Dutch oven, close the lid, and it's just going to sit there and roast <clears throat> in the warm air in the grill. And it's going to finish cooking from carryover. It's going to be crispy, delicious, and juicy. And pickle juice is marvelous. It, with pickle juice, it often comes out tasting like those potato chips, the... Um, uh, the, the vinegar flavored potato chips it's fantastic I th absolutely adore it so pickle juice is a great marinade especially for frying things and tr and I've written all about this frying stuff believe me it's perfectly safe it's safer than doing it indoors you don't set off the smoke alarm you don't muck up the countertop and the stove top with the spattering and it just tastes great so Pickle juice. Kevin's asking if it's king salmon. They send all kinds of salmon, not just salmon, but they send um, uh, 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 black cod and uh, a variety of fish, all wild caught, line caught, not farmed. Um, they have a fleet of independent small fishermen. It's called Sitka Salmon Shares. They don't pay me to invort, endorse them. But I live in the Midwest. I live in Chicago. And I was raised in Florida, which means I love fish. And when I moved to Chicago, it was a shock to my system. You, you just can't get fresh fish in the Midwest. It's, you can get fish, but by definition, it's a day or two older because it takes a day or two longer to get it here. And if you know about seafood, that day or two can make a huge difference. So this stuff is all caught up in S S Alaska line caught, brought right to their um, plant, and fa flash frozen, and I'll tell you, it's marvelous. Hey, Gregory Terrell, you live in western Cook County suburbs. I'm in Brookfield, dude. Can I recommend a good butcher shop in the area? My favorite is Standard Market on Ogden Avenue, and I think it's Downers. Um, uh, the, you know, one of the problems is, and this is nationwide, not just here in Chicago area, um, a lot of butchers are out of business now. Costco and Walmart and the big stores have put them out of business. My local grocer, um, and it's just a mom and pop, there's like three stores in the chain, Tischler's it's called, and it's just about a mile from my house. And they have butchers on the premises. And I'll tell you, knowing a good butcher is better than knowing a stockbroker. I'll go in there and I'll occasionally, the, the head butcher usually gets there early in the morning because that's when the delivery trucks come in. So you don't want to get there at three o'clock looking for the head butcher. Get there in the morning. But I have been known to show up around 11 or 12 o'clock when they're getting ready to break for lunch. And they got a picnic table out back where they all sit around and have lunch. I'll show up with a slab of ribs and slap it on the table and say, hey, guys, thanks a lot. Well, they remember me. And when they see me hovering around the meat counter, I've seen them come out and say to me, hey, meathead, we just got in some uh, ribeyes, and they're top choice. They're almost prime, and uh, they're really great. Would you like me to cut you some steaks? Yes. I mean, that, getting to know a butcher is really good. Um, the folks out at Standard Market are pretty good, but I was taught by several standalone butcher store guys, and they're all gone now. Now, there's a new generation of artisanal butchers coming up, but they're artisanal, and they're expensive. They're doing beautiful work, but, you know, it's not like the old Italian guy, and, uh, you know, who just knew how to cut meat. It's a changing world. Uh, 
Uh, T Rock Twenty One is asking about uh, um, putting a pan of water um, uh, under the meat. Okay, a um, couple of thoughts. Your grill or your smoker is generating a lot of energy, heat, right? And it that is generated by the fuel logs or charcoal or uh, propane that's your fuel and oxygen and it takes a lot of oxygen your grill your smoker is going through a lot of oxygen the airflow inside your smoker is huge a pan of water is not going to raise the humidity inside of a smoker. Maybe a tiny bit. The real advantage to that pan of smoker, pan of water, is that when you take meat out of the fridge, when it's cold, it's 38 degrees, and you put it on the smoker, and you should not let it sit around and come to room temp. You want it cold for this reason. When you put it on the smoker, the water that comes out of that pan condenses on the meat, just like it condenses on your bathroom mirror when you get out of the shower. So your meat gets wet. And wet meat is sticky. And smoke sticks to the wet surface. It also cools the meat and slows the cooking. And for things like ribs and brisket and pork butt, you want long, low, slow cooking. So cold meat over a water pan gets you more smoke and more flavor. It's not going to prevent moisture from evaporating from the meat. That meat is going to lose 20 to 30% of its weight in melting fat and water evaporation. And you can't stop it. And that water pan is not going to prevent it. And people don't get it. They think that water pan is adding moisture to the atmosphere. What it's doing is it's cooling the meat by condensing on it. Osmos 3, bought a Mac 2 star based on my review. I've got one, it's the only pellet smoker I own, I love it. But I gotta tell you, some of the new pellet smokers that are coming on the market, we got a guy, Max Good, and Max works full time testing grills and smokers. And he's testing the new Traeger. I forget the name of it, but it's 3500 bucks. But it's got everything, including an induction burner on the side. I mean, this is, you know, this is Star Wars. Um, and so uh, he's testing it now. Um, but um, everything we've heard about it, it, it is amazing. And some of these others, you know, Green Mountain Grills, some of these other guys are making... Some really good pellet smokers, but I love my Mac 2 Star. Yeah, Fred Hickson's asking. I'm sorry, I was mentioning the rubs. I do have a barbecue sauce. Mm, there she is. Um, it's Kansas City style sauce, a red sauce. It's pretty good. You know, it's nothing vastly different than the other Kansas City sauces. I think it's better. We worked really hard to make it taste good. There's a secret ingredient if you guys can guess it. Um, but, uh, I'm very proud of it, but it's a good old fashioned red barbecue sauce. I'm very proud of it. Uh, -huh. uh, Gregory Terrell is telling us that he's, uh, used my last meal rib recipe on a pit barrel smoker. Those pit barrels are a heck of a good device. Three, 300, 400 bucks, I forget the current price, delivered to your door. No fuss, no muss, no fancy assembly. Pull it out of the box, start cooking. And it just cooks. It just makes great food. Um, Caro is saying he finds the water pan keeps his grill cleaner and the water prevents drippings from burning. Yes. The water will keep the drippings from burning, but is that what you want? Now, here's an interesting thought. 
depending on what kind of grill you've got. When those drippings hit hot metal or coals, they vaporize. And those vapors go back up and hit the meat, and they flavor the meat. And there's pretty good evidence that that's a good thing, not a bad thing. So the water pan will catch the drips and keep them from burning. But it may be inhibiting this neat little feature. If you've ever been to, oh God, I'm drawing a blank. In Alabama, uh, this is getting old, folks. Um, Tuscaloosa, Alabama, home of the University of Alabama, Dreamland, thank you. Dreamland Barbecue. They've been around forever. And they cook over wood, but they cook directly above the wood. And the fat and the juices and the rubs drip onto the wood and vaporize back up on the meat. And the meat has almost a beef steak-like flavor. Because, it, you know, that's what you get when you cook a steak. You get those juices back up on it. And it's marvelous. Um... Something to think about. You might try it. Okay, I don't know for sure what you're talking about, Joe SDS. I believe I read on the website that when cooking steaks, you prefer to wait to season until after you've seared with oil and then use the hot oil to crisp up the seasoning? No, this is not something I've endorsed. Can you tell? Um, uh, uh, all right, background. Really core concept in grilling and smoking is how thick is the meat? The way you cook it depends a lot on how thick it is. Because the thicker it is, the longer it takes to cook the center of the meat. Heat moves slowly through meat. Meat is mostly water. Water is an insulator. So thick steaks take longer to cook than thin steaks for obvious reasons. And you cook them differently. But let's talk about a thick steak, for example. If I have a ribeye steak, a boneless ribeye steak, because I want it to cook evenly. I don't want the bone. The bone is a heat shield. It blocks the energy, and the meat next to the bone is five to 10 degrees less cooked than the rest of the meat. So I want it evenly cooked. I'll take the bone off. I may throw the bone on there and gnaw on the bone later, but I'm not cooking it on the steak. So I got a boneless ribeye, two inches thick. I'm gonna salt that thing an hour or two in advance so the salt will penetrate, okay? Then I'm gonna start it on the indirect side, away from the infrared radiation, away from the coals, away from the flames. I'm going to gently warm it at about 225. I'm going to warm it gently. And that way, it's going to be an even temperature throughout. If I throw it over hot coals, it's going to be dark on the outside, then a layer of tan, then a layer of pink, and then it's going to be properly cooked in the center. If I cook it in the shade, in the indirect side, it'll be evenly cooked throughout. And when it gets to about 120, my target is 130 to 135. When it gets to about 120... I'm going to lift the lid and move it directly over the flame, and I'm going to sear the snot out of it. At that point, I may paint it with an oil or butter or better still, rendered beef fat. And occasionally, when I have aged beef and I trim the fat off the aged beef, aged beef fat tastes different than regular beef fat. And if you paint meat with aged beef fat, it gives it an aged flavor. So I may paint it at this point because oil is a really good conductor of heat. So I'll paint it maybe with some oil over the direct heat. And now I'm searing it. And I sear it right over the flame or the coals. And three or four minutes per side. And I flip and I flip and I flip. Because I don't want energy building up and moving to the center. I'm treating the surface when it was on the indirect side away from the heat. I was treating the interior. Now I'm treating the exterior. And so I'm searing the exterior. I'm getting color and flavor on the exterior. And I flip it so that the energy that is built up in the exterior 
comes off into the atmosphere rather than working its way down into the center of the meat and overcooking the meat. I've moved it over at 120. My target's 130. It is going to continue to warm, <clears throat> but not very fast. And I become the human rotisserie. Flip, 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 flip. I know all of this is against what you have learned and been taught and read and your daddy and all the cookbooks taught you. And I'm here to tell you it's wrong. That's the way things used to be done. We now understand the physics, the chemistry, the food science better. And a reverse sear on a thick steak, the technique I'm describing, started on the in salt at first, started on the indirect side, then when it gets to about 120, 125, move it to the direct side, lift the lid, turn it frequently until you get an all over brown. You don't want grill marks, you want it all over brown, that's flavor all over. Grill marks are just stripes of flavor. And when it hits 130, 135, it's done. And when you cut into it, it's the same medium rare edge to edge. No rainbow effect. Um, so the oil won't go on until the last step, the searing. And I don't always bother with it. I mean, sometimes I just throw it over the coals and that's it. But if you're going to throw oil on it, that's the time to do it. Dan Mancusa is saying he doesn't notice the uh, extra smoke flavor when using it. Probably won't. I mean, it's on the rub in the sauce, and it's not a strong flavor. I think if you were cooking it indoors in an indoor oven, you might notice it. But outdoors, the flavor of the smoker or the grill is going to overwhelm it. Kevin is saying he disagrees, but I don't know what you disagree about. Because that was a while ago. I don't know if you're disagreeing about my ribs or my steak. What 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 your what your issue is. How do I prep fish for the grill? I asked Nathan Tracy. Fish is such a pain in the ass. It's like 90% water. And it sees those metal grates and it says, Oh, baby, I love you. And it just wants to stick to those grates. And it's really hard to get fit. Um, it depends on whether it's fresh water or salt water. But I will salt it in advance. Um, maybe a little less than I would a, a piece of beef or pork. Um, because if it's saltwater fish, there is going to be salt in the meat. Um, and But as I said, salt does more than amplify flavor. It does help retain moisture. Um, I've played with, with a good deal of success, with mayonnaise. Now, I know some of you out there absolutely hate the idea of mayonnaise, but mayonnaise is an emulsion of mostly oil, a little egg, and maybe a little lemon juice or acid. Um, but it's mostly oil. And it makes a thick coating. And it's pretty good at helping keep the fish from sticking. Now, I'm an advocate of oiling the meat, not the grate. When you oil the grate, the grate's hot. And what happens to oil when it hits high heats? It cracks. That's what the term is. It cracks. It, chemically, it changes. And it smokes. And that smoke is not appetizing. So if you oil the meat, the meat's cold. It won't crack as fast. So I prefer to oil the meat that, than, the, than the grate. But when it comes to fish, I'm oiling everything in sight. I'm oiling the meat, I'm oiling the fish, I'm oiling my wife, I'm oiling everything. Um, just get it, you know, as slick as you can. Now, I often use um, one of those gadgets. They look like a tennis racket, two tennis rackets hinged at the top. You've seen them? They're available online. Um, <clears throat> and the fish goes in between them. <clears throat> and that's really nice because you can lift it up and flip it. You can flip it. You can turn. So it's really easy to turn the fish. Um, 
but it will still stick to the to the rackets, you know, to the to the not as bad. Um, there's a product on the market called grill grates. Now I know that sounds like a generic term, but it's one word: grill, no space, great. Um, grill grates, and I have a, an in-depth review about them on AmazingRibs.com, and I really like them. I recommend them, especially if you have a gas grill. They're really good at distributing the heat, evening out hot spots, but they have like railings, and then you have they come with a spatula that's more like a fork, like my fingers here, and it goes between the rails underneath the meat. And then you lift it up, and it lifts the fish off the grates pretty darn well. So grill grates are really good for fish. Mayonnaise is really good fish for fish. Oil is really good for fish. And then seasonings. Um, I'm a big fan of tarragon on fish. I love tarragon on fish. Eggs, too. So I'll, 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 I have a, a fish rub. I haven't. It's on the website, um, a fish rub. It's got a lot of tarragon on it. I like that. <clears throat> Kevin says, cold attracts meat. I think you mean cold attracts smoke. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> yeah. All right, Kevin, put the wine glass down. Oh, this is an interesting question. Jason Pettis. Okay. One of my thoughts on people grinding dry-aged pellicle to mix with fresh for burgers seems potentially dangerous if you aren't cooking well done. Um, okay. Some of the best burgers I ever had were at a steakhouse that's now out of business in Chicago. Um but they had their own beef aging locker. Now, if you age beef, what happens is the exterior dehydrates. It turns almost black. It's ugly. Sometimes it gets moldy. And you trim that off. And when you trim that off, the meat inside is fine. They would trim it off, and I presume they were not using the moldy stuff. But they were making burgers from the trim. And they were god-awful good. Um, Jason, there are a couple of aging systems. In fact, the chef for this restaurant um, is doing um, testing for us right now on dry aging beef systems. There's some beef lockers and bags. And we've sent him every dry aging system we can find and he's testing them this guy knows dry aged meat better than anybody i know so we'll be having some stuff soon on dry aged meat and techniques for doing it at home and what's the best methods but and he's the guy that made these so i'll have to ask him um yeah i don't think i want to use it if it's moldy and you can't always see the mold either but I know he was making god-awful good burgers from the trim. So it's a heck of a good question. I don't know the answer. You've stumped the star. Brian is asking, is water pan necessary when smoking baby backs in a Primo? Brian, I don't know if you just showed up, and I haven't seen your name, but we talked about water pans earlier at length. And the, what the water pan does is it puts moisture on the meat, it, and it doesn't put it doesn't prevent evaporation. I, I'm not going to repeat myself for, for the benefit of people who've been here. Um, if you didn't hear me on the subject earlier, this will be uploaded to YouTube. I would recommend you go back because I spoke at length on what do water pans do, and it's not what you think. Yeah, Kevin's pointing out mayonnaise sear is wonderful. I, I didn't point out. The mayonnaise doesn't flavor the fish, which is weird. You can't taste it. Um, I mean, really, mayonnaise has very little flavor on its own. It's just egg and oil. Um, but it does help prevent sticking and lock in moisture. Um, Nathan Tracy is saying he's had really good success with fish on the flat side of grill grates. 
Grill grates have these rails on one side, but the other side is essentially like a griddle. And I'm the one that told the guy who makes them, hey, cook your burgers on the backside. And I never thought of that. <laughs> yeah, it's a griddle. And um, get it good and oily and slick. And yeah, if, if that's a good place to do it. It's like a griddle. And I do fish on a cast iron griddle a lot. And I'll put smoke in the air so it will settle on the fish. Um, but I, I have a cast iron griddle or the backside of my grill grates. And that's a great technique. Ah, Greg, um, Greg Witt is asking, cool barbecue side, something beyond slaw and potato salad. I've got one for you, pal. One of my favorites. I've been eating it for the last couple of weeks. Go to AmazingRibs.com and look up Thai cucumbers. Have you ever gone to Thai restaurants? You know, they often serve you a little bowl of cucumbers, and they're a little sweet, and they're a little tart, and they have this exotic aroma. Basically, it's rice vinegar, which is not as strong as cider or distilled vinegar. It's very mild. A little water, some sugar, thin sliced cucumber, thin sliced onion, and here's the secret ingredient, Thai basil. Now you can find this in better grocery stores. My wife grows it. It's different than regular basil. It's of the same family, but it has a marvelous flavor. I absolutely adore it. And you pick the leaves, and you bring them in, you stack them up, and you roll them up like a cigarette, and then you chop them so that you get little thin strips called chiffonade. And you throw them in there, and you let it marinate for at least an hour. Overnight is better. And it's just wonderful. Basically, they're mildly pickled cucumber slices, but they're a little sweet, um, and the Thai basil just takes it over the top. I love this stuff. I could bathe in it. Try that one. Lewis Parks is asking, thoughts on cooking with avocado oil? Uh, claims a high smoke point of 500. You know, I had a guy who makes avocado oil pitching me on it, and I had never worked with it, and... He sent me some, and it was this really dark green, and it was incredibly strong flavored, and I didn't like it. And I don't think it was an example of your, your more typical avocado oils. So I need to do more work, and I'm sorry, I don't have a strong opinion on it. All I know is this stuff, which was really expensive avocado oil, couldn't stand it. So I, but I know people love it. And so obviously I'm missing out on something. I got to do some more experimenting with it. Get out. Jason Pettis is saying, little known fact is that tarragon is what gives blues hog its distinct flavor. Are you kidding me? I have been trying for years to make something close to Blue's Hog. Blue's Hog is a great barbecue sauce. Um, the guy invented, unfortunately, is, is deceased. Um, but it became so popular that everybody on the barbecue circuit was using it, or they were buying it and doctoring it, but it was a variation. Look for it. Blue's Hog, they have a couple of flavors, but it's the original Blue's Hog. Um, and it's delicious. And I have made something called Jazz Hog because I didn't want to rip him off, which I thought was close, but it's missing something and I can't nail it. I'm going to try tarragon in it. Thank you, Jason. Do I have a garden? Yes, I do. Uh, it's not mine. Um, my wife uh, was a, a PhD microbiologist, worked for the FDA, she was in charge of food safety, uh, and uh, she was the editor of Food Microbiology magazine, and she retired a couple of years ago, and um, she's always been a gardener, and uh, she took the University of Illinois Master Gardener classes and is a certified degree-carrying Master Gardener. And uh, we have this gorgeous garden. And come August, I'm veg head. 
I'll tell you, there are many, many nights, weeks, when I don't eat meat. I mean, when the eggplants and the tomatoes and the zucchinis and everything are coming in, I can live without meat. It's hard. In fact, I did once, just on a dare, I went the whole month of August without touching meat. And I was doing great until about week four. And I started getting really bad stomach cramps. <laughs> but, um, um, yeah, I mean, when the garden comes, I'm, I'm in Illinois. And the soil is so black, so rich. You could spit and another human being would grow. Um, it's fantastic. Yeah, Kevin, you've mentioned Darren Wilson's new rub. I, I, don't, I haven't tried it yet. Uh, favorite veggie grill recipes. I've got a number on the website and in my book, but one of my favorites is eggplant parmesan. Um, you know, eggplant parmesan, typically, you take the eggplant, you slice it, and then you dredge it in um, egg and breadcrumbs, and then you fry it. And eggplant is a sponge. It just soaks up the oil and becomes heavy and oily. And, and then you put tomato sauce on it and melt cheese on it. It's delicious. It's really heavy. I do it on the grill. I take that eggplant and I lightly oil it just so it won't stick. Um, and uh, I grill it. I make my own tomato sauce by grilling the tomatoes, fire roasted tomatoes. You pay extra for those. Get fresh garden tomatoes, cut them in half, um, grill them, cut side down, make sure the grate, uh, uh, your grates are really clean. Flip them over to the skin side down. And then you can pop that skin right off with your fingers and run them through the blender. And if you want, throw in some uh, oregano, whatever. And you've got a grilled, fire-roasted tomato, um, tomato sauce. And um, so I'll take a big, thick disc of eggplant, put some tomato sauce on top, um, cut a, a slice of uh, buffalo mozzarella, Lay that on top, sprinkle a little Parmigiano Reggiano, uh, close the lid, and then everybody gets one of these. And I, I even have a video on the website, AmazingRibs.com, of me making this dish, and it is gorgeous. And then um, another dish, I haven't got this recipe on the website, but I do it all the time. You know, you get to a point in the summer when you go out and you look at those zucchinis and you say, i got to pick those tomorrow. And they go out there tomorrow, and they went from 12 inches to 24 inches. Overnight. And they're like a baseball bat. And everybody says, oh, they're no good when they're that big. They are. What you do is you slice them in half lengthwise. You scoop out the center, which is dry and pulpy. But the meat beneath the skin is delicious. And you scoop it out, and then you put whatever you would put on a pizza in there. So you can put in some sausage or ground meat, tomato sauce, cheese, bell peppers, whatever you want. You just load it up so you've got this canoe that you've hollowed out and you've piled it high with essentially pizza fixings, cheese on top, on the grill. Oh, okay, first, first, first you take that zucchini that you've cut in half and hollowed out. You throw that on the grill first because the the walls are pretty thick and you need to par cook it to tenderize them, give it some flavor. You cook it on both sides until it becomes a little flexible. Then you stuff it. Then you put it on there and finish it. And if you want, you can par cook the stuffing. If you're afraid that the uh, sausage isn't going to be cooked through, you can do that in a frying pan. And I'll tell you, kids love it. I mean, it's zucchini pizza. pizza kini, I call it. It's fantastic. I love that. Um, stuffed peppers. My wife grows, um, um, oh, what are those dark green peppers called? I'll think of it. You know what it is. Somebody tell me. The Mexican, um, uh, but we stuff those. Stuffed peppers. Um, stuffed tomatoes. Uh, I grill tomatoes. I smoke tomatoes. Um, poblano, thank you, Sky Joe. They're poblanos. Um, uh, you cut them in half um, and uh, pull out the seeds. Fill them up with, I like to put chorizo in them. Chori I, I mix chorizo and chopped apples. 
because chorizo's got a kick and the apples are sweet. I stuff them and then I use um, cheddar cheese on top. Pop them in the grill. Oh my, they're marvelous. Um, one of my all-time favorite things for August is, um, and I do have this on the website, smoked cherry tomato raisins. You get, if you've ever grown cherry tomatoes, one bush is enough for a lifetime. If you get crazy and plant two or three bushes, you're going to be swimming in cherry tomatoes. And that's the mistake we often make. Well, you take these cherry tomatoes when they're ripe and you get a sharp knife and you just stab them a few times. And you get a whole bunch of them and you take them out onto the smoker. You got to put down a, a grill topper so they don't fall through the grates. And just get the temperature as low as you can on the smoker and smoke them. It'll take several hours, but they'll dehydrate. The water will evaporate through the stabs and they'll get to like raisins. Don't let them get any harder than that. When they're feeling like raisins, take them off. They're unbelievable. They're as sweet as raisins. Um, they have the same texture as raisins, but they have the flavor of smoked sun-dried tomatoes. Think of that, smoked sun-dried tomatoes. And you can do that with Romas and bigger tomatoes too. But these little cherry tomatoes now that have been smoked, I freeze them and we use them all winter long on pizzas, on salads, focaccia, fantastic. All right. Well, we're coming up on an hour and a half and I believe I have hit the bottom of the questions Yeah, I think I've covered um, most of your questions. Uh, you hit me with a few more, and we'll see if we can hang out for another 10, 15 minutes. Otherwise, uh, we'll call it a night. Um, my wife is sitting out back with a gin and tonic. I'll go, I got a glass of wine here, and I'll just go out back and enjoy her. Uh, what am I drinking? Um, it's Côte du Rhone, a, uh, a French wine from the Côte du Rhone, the... Rhone River area, South France. Um, I, I'm a wino. I don't know if you guys know, but I was once, prior to my fling with barbecue, the wine critic of the Washington Post, the Chicago Tribune, and I published a magazine about wine called International Wine Review. I started a company called the Beverage Testing Institute, which still exists. So, I'm a wino. You know the difference between a wine and a kind of cereal, don't you? Ten bucks a bottle. Sorry. Trade joke. Greg is asking, Greg, you got great questions. Um, do I ever pickle my garden veggies? He's on a, a veggie kick right now, yeah. Um, I'm doing more things with pickling. Um, uh, uh, cauliflower is great pickled. Um, my wife is not a huge pickle fan. Oh, jalapenos. I do a, um, um, a pickle, I, I, I slice them into rings, and it, there's a lot of sugar in this recipe, sugar and vinegar, so they're sweet and hot and tart, and boy, are they good on sandwiches. I chop them up on a tuna fish. Um, uh, 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 there's a recipe for that on the website, and they're really good, and of course, I love pickled cucumbers. I just make pickles. Um, so, yeah, there's several good books that have come out recently on pickling. I'm not into fermented pickles. I've tried it, and they've gone wrong on me. Um, it, when you try to do fermented pickles in a crock, you've got to really control for contamination and temperature. And I've had weird things happen, and their fermentations go on. And it's never really worked out well for me, but refrigerator pickles easy to do basically it's just salt sugar vinegar herbs spices whatever and you just either throw the food in it or you boil the pickling liquid throw the food in it and that pasteurizes it 
and then you put it in a jar, but you have to keep it in the fridge. And, uh, you know, I, we've got a spare fridge in the basement, so, you know, I've got, you know, a couple of jars of these pickled jalapenos down there waiting. Uh, pickled carrots. I've done pickled carrots. Thank you, Lewis. Yeah, so pickling is pretty easy unless you do the fermented pickling. And, and I've not done sauerkraut successfully. I've tried it and failed. Um, and um, uh, kimchi. I'm not a fan of the flavor, so I you know, did it once and gave up. But, of course, I do pickled cucumbers, Sky Joe. Yeah, they're easy. They're easy. And I have a great dill pickle. You know what I like to pickle? End of the season, the green tomatoes. If you've ever been to a deli, a Jewish deli in New York, like um, Katz's or Carnegie Deli, they often do their pastrami sandwiches, and there's a bowl of pickled green tomatoes. They're fantastic. They're really crunchy. And at the end of the season, those tomatoes just never ripen. They're really hard and crunchy. And you make a dill pickle brine. And I've got the recipe for this on the website. And they're fantastic. I do them every year. And um, members of my family are doing it now. Um, and uh, uh, pickled green tomatoes are wonderful. Absolutely love them. I like them better than pickled cucumbers. Pickled red onions, yeah. And boy, you can make quick pickled red onions, uh, Greg, in like 30 minutes. You get a red onion, you slice it up. You got some vinegar, some sugar, you boil it up in a pan, throw the onion in there, and 30 minutes later, you've got pickled onions, and they're fantastic on anything. Tuna sandwiches, um, uh, pulled pork sandwiches, um, burgers, yeah, pickled onions. And yes, Sky Joe, you can use the juice from those pickles. Absolutely. I do it all the time. In fact, usually, I'll be able to reuse it. When I empty that jar, uh, I, um, I will get a new batch of tomatoes and chop them up and throw them in there. It's a little dilute because the juice from the tomato dilutes the brine. So I may throw a splash or two of uh, vinegar in there just to amp it up a notch. But I can usually get two uses out of a jar of brine. And then what's left over, marinate your chicken in it or something. Okay, well, we're getting up close to uh, 9 o'clock, and we're getting up close to an hour and a half. And uh, I'm starting to run out of gas here. So I'm going to say, guys, thank you. Great questions tonight. I wish you all a happy 4th of July. Um, uh, I hope you get to spend it with friends and family. Um, I hope you get to enjoy um, and uh, think about the, uh, the greatness of this country and uh, the reason for the event. And um, I hope uh, you'll uh, uh, check out the website and maybe even buy the book or the rubs and sauces. And do take that 30-day free trial of the Pitmaster Club. Sign up for our newsletter. We only send it out once a month, maybe twice. We're not going to spam you. Uh, we put all kinds of new recipes and reviews in there. And uh, stay tuned. We'll see you uh, last Thursday of next month. Have a happy 4th of July and a great summer, everybody. Good night. That's all for now, folks. Thanks for staying awake, and please visit AmazingRibs.com for the articles, recipes, and reviews mentioned in this chat with the Barbecue Whisperer and Hedonism Evangelist from AmazingRibs.com, the planet's biggest and baddest barbecue and grilling website, Meathead. It's